Guys, welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. This week, I have the distinct privilege and honor to welcome a guest that not too long ago, I got to meet in person, sit down, have conversation with face-to-face, have a phenomenal meal, get to see him in some of the behind-the-scenes actions, and realize that he looks like one of my childhood heroes <laughs> in person. But that's another story. So without further ado, I want to welcome one of the most phenomenal and most powerful stories as a guest on the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. Guys, welcome Randy K. Randy, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Thank you for having me, Ryan. It's all downhill from now. If I was your boyhood hero and uh, you realize that, you know, I'm far from that. So <laughs> just, just looking uh, <laughs> a little bit like him, you know. But, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll kind of let people in really quickly. I, I my oldest son is a huge uh, comic book, you know, superhero movie type thing. And we were on the road going to minister in another state. We came across uh, the home of Superman and we went to the museum and all this and everything. And in the museum, I was sharing, they have different sections of each of the characters, each person plays Superman. They came and come Christopher Reeve. And I said, that's my Superman. So you fast forward, we're having dinner one night together. And I keep kind of looking out of the corner of my eye going, Randy looks like somebody, but I can't. And then it <laughs> hits me. It's Christopher Reeve. You know, as a child, Superman, that was my Superman. So <laughs> it was kind of surreal to look and, and realize this is Randy. But man, he looks like Clark Kent if he had glasses on right now. <laughs> yeah, more like Clark Kent than uh, Superman, I think. <laughs> well, there was no ripping a part of the shirt and the S emblem and all that, you know, yeah. but it was a great time nevertheless. So what a way to start things off. For those that may not be familiar with Randy K. Randy, give us a little bit of insight of who you are. Yes. Well, I, you know, I came from the uh, corporate arena. I was in uh, healthcare, CEO of a biotech uh, company and all that stuff. And then, um, you know, I, I was, I was a Christian. I was a believer, but I was uh, an agnostic in my youth. So, you know, there's a degree of skepticism that comes with that. You know, I'm scientifically fact-based minded and i uh, came back from a conference out in washington dc and i i realized that my faith was uh, so challenged that i had never really kind of tested it not had been tested to the extent that it was tested when my daughter had uh, several mini strokes and she woke up to night terrors and we were struggling with that and our our drug from our pharma company for which was a virtual cure for Alzheimer's was pulled off the market by the FDA. And so it was a challenging time, you know, and my faith was challenged having, you know, taught in churches and the like. And so I just cried out, uh, God, you know, you need to show up this time. And it was a crisis of faith. And so that was the, the moment when we talked about Superman, you know, my idea of God was more probably akin to that uh, than it was the familiar. Uh, and uh, that's the point at which um, my story began and, and my ministry uh, really com- was, was precipitated by, by the event of me uh, dying. To understand where you're at now, I do want to go back to something you, you mentioned in your youth. It was agnostic. And I think there's a lot of people that listen. They, they easily understand what it means to be an atheist. I want you to break down because really to be agnostic and be where you're at now is really a phenomenal aspect because you don't hear that terminology a lot. And so what I want you to do when you say I was agnostic in my youth, what specifically does that mean? Yeah, that's a good question, Ryan, because I think a lot of people confuse agnosticism from atheism. You know, atheism is the person who comes to the decision that there is no God. You know, in other words, they become their own God because they've decided that they are all knowing, at least knowing enough to determine that uh, the, the possibility of a God is no longer existent. But an agnostic is one who questions the existence of God. Is there a God? And so I had, um, you know, I went to undergrad and graduate school at Northwestern uh, University. And as an agnostic, I joined a number of other people uh, to run a test, uh, a project basically, 
to invalidate all the religions. And so there was a, a computer the size of a building called Vogelback at Northwestern. And I was working with people uh, smarter than me in terms of the IT or a technology aspect of things. And so we were plugging in all of these data points, trying to disprove all the religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism, all of them and we were able to invalidate uh an, every other religion besides uh, judeo-christianity because they were basically either a fusion of beliefs or they were based on uh, a, a document or a series of document from a single uh, individual and that really didn't test well you know we found that uh, the prophetic statements that were made by some of the other religions were less than 10%. But then we discovered that the prophetic uh, uh, statements that were made in the Bible were a thousand percent, and that is unheard of. And so this was a group of agnostics, those who are questioning the existence of God and questioning all of the religions. So intellectually, we came to the conclusion that we could not invalidate Judeo-Christianity, but it wasn't until I had an accident uh, when I was working with, uh, with a company, and I should have died during that accident, but it was during that time that I survived, and I felt a pull. You know, I cried out uh, through my window where I was living at the time, and I said, God, if you are real, I need to know you as a person and not just some pages in a book. And that was the state of mind I was when I went into a, uh, walked into, and this was a miracle up there. For me, it was a, a miracle uh, kind of akin to the parting of the waters because I went into a church <laughs> and it was a revivalist church, charismatic spirit filled. And I thought, what are these people doing? They're raising their hands, they're dropping on the floor and all this other stuff. And that is the point at which I received uh, Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Um, and, you know, I, I, ha I was born again at that time. Yeah, so I was no longer an agnostic. I had discovered uh, the true, one true God. What do you think, looking back, what do you think was driving that questioning? Was it, do you look back, was it just because of where you were going forward in life in the medical industry? Was it, you know, just personal experiences of childhood? What, what do you think just now where you're at, because all this is going to make sense for everybody listening a little bit later, but what was the driving force of the questioning? Yeah. Another good question, Ryan, because uh, I've prayed about that. You know, why is it that some people, you know, can say, oh, I've been a Christian since, you know, I can remember, you know, as a child or whatever. And others, you know, and it seems to be a, um, a growing number or a vast uh, number of people uh, throughout the world now who are saying, you know, uh, you know, I don't, I don't kind of, I'm not kind of on board with this Christian thing. You know, I think there's an amalgamation of things, you know, maybe a more universalistic uh, approach to faith. And I think uh, to your question or to your point, uh, Ryan, I, you know, the Lord was revealing to me that I had um, felt that God had rejected me uh, when I was uh, a youth, you know, I was a kid and I was overweight, uh, so I was bullied in school and then I, you know, I uh, played football to try to overcome that and, um, you know, that didn't work and nothing seemed to, to to really be the answer. And then I was a sickly person throughout most of my life. I had lung infections and I was in the hospital. So I felt like God had kind of failed me. And that was the attitude with which I uh, brought things. And then what exacerbated that was when Christians would, uh, let's say, prophesize me, you know, share Jesus. Um, I saw the hypocrisy in their life um, I didn't see the mirror image of myself that I was, you know, I was uh, being a hypocrite in some certain, in many circumstances, but I saw certainly theirs. And I, I again, I didn't have a genuine um, relationship with Jesus. 
So in intellectualism, you know, science, you know, I uh, led clinical teams. So that was a more steady kind of anchor for me uh, to adhere to the scientifically minded things that I could identify and I could understand because I certainly couldn't understand God and why God would allow uh, suffering in this world. That was a conundrum to me. It really is a shocking, um, I, I want to say, relational side of this, of how you you grow up questioning the existence of God, because I genuinely believe there's probably a lot of people that have that similar, not the exact, but similar story of, I felt like I was abandoned, I felt like I was not loved, rejected, whatever the case may be, and it leads this life of because you weren't there for me, I'm going to prove that you're not even there in general. Mm -hmm. You're not real, which is just really, really fascinating to me because what I'm saying is you have this really relational side that breeds or develops this um, scientific and an uh, analytical pursuit of the non-existence of God to fast forward. You are clinically dead for nearly 30 minutes. And in that process, the relationship that you built your agnostic, agnostic mindset is now taken to a totally different level. What happened when you were clinically dead? Yeah. You know, I challenged God. That's a dangerous thing to do to challenge God to say, okay, you need to show up, you know, uh, and so that was the state of mind I was in at the time. And plus what happened was I'd flown back on a long flight and, uh, you know, I had a soreness in my leg. I thought, you know, nothing really of it. Went to the doctor's office. Uh, we were planning a trip, a vacation, and uh, was determined that I had blood clots. And so I was rushed to the ER. That's where, you know, it combined with a blood infection that I had, a bacterial infection that was drug resistant. I was uh, clotting throughout my body, uh, started convulsing, and that's when everything went dark. So, um, so I went into this really, you know, uh, wondering, you know, God, why again have you abandoned me? And so, the Lord was really gracious to me. I saw the warring um, angels and demons in the distance as, uh, as it felt like, uh, it felt something, uh, Ryan, like a pulling of my shirt. You know, I was, I was convulsing. I, I felt uh, still at, at some point, and that was the point at which I had flatlined, uh, as you said, for a little over 30 minutes. And at that point, I felt like something had tugged at my uh, shirt. Um, then I was a third party of my body. I actually saw my body and I was being pulled by, uh, by light. And I saw these warring figures in the distance. And I didn't understand exactly what that was. Uh, in hindsight, I believe that those were warring figures over my soul as I was going through this uh, consternation, you know, of God in the state of mind that I was in, born again, yes, but also a uh, conflicted mind uh, because I had suffered from all of these different things throughout much of my life. And I still hadn't resolved all of those things, but the grace of God was so, so magnanimous that when I cried out the name of Jesus, I was um, in, that, in that moment, and it was really in that moment, that I was side to side with this figure and his um, soft, uh, cottony, uh, white robe. And he leaned his cheek into mine and I felt his, his beard uh, rubbing against my face. And I knew instantly that this was Jesus. I knew it. And the first thought that came to mind was, so this is love. And um, that's when I caved. I caved for the first time. I had given up everything, everything in adoration for my Lord and awe for my Lord. And I was, I was sobbing. And um, I knew, I knew him 
not just as my Lord intellectually, but I was with him. I was with him and he picked me up and he turned me uh, and I was looking into his into his eyes and he was tunneling into every dark place within me. And I saw, you know, things that were in my life that were being exposed and um, all of the things that I had been witnessing in my life that used to be condemning to me. Now I saw the grace of God. I saw the grace of God and I had missed that, right? My entire life, I had not fully understood the grace of God, the grace of Jesus in my life for the covering of the multitude of things I had done wrong, the multitude of things I thought I had to prove and he showed me and revealed that it wasn't me. The whole time I was trying to figure out me. And, and he showed me that it wasn't all about me, it was who he was through me that really validated everything that I thought I was about. And I was about, um, my, my personhood was really defined then through the spectrum and the eyes of Jesus. And it was the most amazing revelation. And of course, I was, I was not, I was not in my body at that time. I was my spirit body. And that was the controlling influence and more so the controlling influence over me at that point was, was Jesus and everything and in everything I saw in heaven. I, I think it was so powerful about this moment that you're describing here is um you, you know you describe the warring over that in in my mind automatically goes it's like you're ascending from the first heavenly to the second heavenly to all of a sudden you're in this realm but i think what really jumps out and catches my attention is there wasn't a conversation at that moment it was just you and the son of God. And the fact that he lays his beard to the side of his cheek to your cheek, nothing is said, but it's this overwhelming of love and grace that you're comprehending and at the same time understanding, but there's no words, there's no dialogue, there's nothing. It's just that moment, which is so fascinating to me because I want to go back again. I'm just reminding everybody as they're listening and watching. As an agnostic, it was your goal to prove him wrong by scientific methods and words and knowledge, and wisdom and understanding. And here he is in this moment, revealing himself to you simply by the emotion and the feel, the revelatory of presence and nothing is being said at all. I'm curious, do or as you can kind of look back, do you truly comprehend where you were, that you were in heaven at that moment? Or is it still you're just so overwhelmed by the grace and the love that it's not even a registered thought that I'm no longer in the hospital. I'm here. <laughs> I was consumed, Ryan, with uh, the Lord's presence. I was in the presence of love, but his presence really is pervasive through me, in me, I should say. The glory of God, which I now understand that, you know, a lot of people who have uh, died, let's say, and and they've had near-death experience or afterlife experiences. We talked about the, the light, you know, the light pulling them or whatever. I realized the light, you know, um, Jesus is referred to as the light of love, of the light of uh, the the light of life, and and it was that light that was emanating from him. And so the presence was consuming. And that is something, you know, uh, the wonders of heaven to me were inconsequential to being in his presence. That's all that mattered. You could have wow. thrown me in a trash bin and I would have been satisfied if only I could be there with Jesus, if only I could be with him and, that's what consumed me. That was all that mattered. And that was all that I wanted. 
And that was all that I wanted throughout my entire life. And it was consummated in heaven to the point where it was, I was fully, fully consumed with him. And no longer was I struggling with my body or my mind because my spirit body and my spirit mind were, uh, were ruling over uh, my new body that I had in, uh, in heaven. And so my spirit mind, that is the mind that was, con that was uh, consumed uh, by Christ, and the, the mind that was um, fully um, not just cognizant, but really in the moment with the Lord. And I had such, Ryan, such a tough time ever in my life being in the moment with uh, with jesus you know i was always about planning understanding all of the cognitive things uh and and i was in the moment with the lord just consumed with him so that his thoughts then to your point earlier his thoughts were my thoughts uh, my thoughts were not his thoughts. That's a, that's an important distinction, I think, to make. My thoughts were not his thoughts, but his thoughts were my thoughts. That is, I understood not the things of God, but I understood the things that he wanted to speak to me. And that was uh, the revelation that the full revelation I had in heaven was being consumed with what he was revealing to me in the moment that I was with him. And we journeyed uh, throughout heaven. He revealed multiple things uh, to me. But again, they were all through the lenses, really through the eyes of Jesus, you know, and I know that that's a goal that I have personally uh, now is to see through the eyes of Jesus. But in heaven, I was I was truly seeing through the eyes of Jesus. Again, it's not a cognitive kind of um, understanding in terms of knowing or being aware, you know, of we talk about being a full aware, awareness of God and, you know, and people say, I am God. No, it wasn't that at all. I was still, I was still, God was God. Um, but I was consumed with Jesus. So when I, for example, uh, Ryan, when I had looked at people and I had looked at, um, you know, the, the visions of all of the, the river of life that was emanating from Jesus, which I saw from his, uh, flowing from his feet, when I saw the glory of God from the throne room and the angels surrounding that throne, and when I saw the angels as I was walking with Jesus, and I saw the, the glory throughout all, all of heaven, and I saw the people and some of them praying and some of them doing activities that were just, um, just exponentially more let's say intentional than than anything uh in this world i was seeing through the lenses of jesus so all of these things i was understanding not with my physical mind but understanding with the mind of christ which didn't require that i resolve or understand necessarily or translate any of it i was just assimilating and synthesizing this through um through God, uh, who is love. And it was just the most amazing things for which we have, by the way, no words in the English lexicon or any of the world's lexicons to explain that what that is, but it's a phenomena that is truly manifested uh, in heaven. I think, you know, the reason that what jumps out, I, I hear so many people, you know, a lot of the times it's joking. People say, when I die and go to heaven, I'm gonna have a conversation with Adam and Eve, or I'm gonna talk to Moses, or I'm gonna talk to Noah. Noah, why did you let mosquitoes on? Why did you let snakes on? All this type of stuff, you know, as if we're big and bad. But, you know, it, it's one of those things that it jumps out and catches my attention. The attention is at that moment, you're just captured by presence. Uh, and I think that's something really that, you know, I, I, I heard a gentleman not long ago, and I, I don't even know who said it, so I don't know who to give credit to, it says, you know, you're dying to talk to someone in heaven, said that can be part of the plan after you spend a thousand years at his feet, you know, mm. <laughs> you know, in that <laughs> process, because that's where you'll be in that. But ultimately, as you're describing, you begin to see things in heaven. Uh, now, I don't want to let 
everything out because we're going to talk about how you put this into a book. We're going to talk about that book format, how people can get that. But what are some of the things that you can share with us that you saw in heaven? Yeah. You know, you hit on, Ryan, something I think that is absolutely important, critical. And that is, you know, a lot of people say, you know, I want to see my loved ones in heaven. I saw my grandmother in heaven. Uh, She cupped her hand uh, over her heart. Uh, She was through like a, I explain it kind of like a Monet painting come to life. And I didn't speak with her, but she um, mouthed the words, I love you and uh, I'll see you again. And then she faded away. But back to your point about wanting to see, you know, Adam and Eve or whomever. For me, I had always wanted to see Abraham Lincoln. I just thought if I had a conversation with Abraham Lincoln, you know, in heaven, that would be absolutely terrific. And knowing what I know now, I, If I saw Abraham Lincoln in heaven, uh, I would just say to him, isn't Jesus wonderful? Isn't Jesus wonderful? Because all all of it goes back to Jesus and wanting to be with him because everything was uh, seen through the light of Jesus. So, for example, when I uh, everything in heaven was living and nothing was dying, so I saw the river of life, as I mentioned, emanating from Jesus, and it was feeding uh, flowers and and trees that were growing before my eyes and perpetual life that was blooming forth. And I saw animals and and some of them were kind of a softer version of what I had uh, seen in this world, like, you know, the lions and tigers that are fearsome uh, in the world and they were comfortable. And, and I saw children, uh, I saw linens uh, that were flowing down and covering the floor with a soft floor. Um, and children uh, romping through those linens. And I realized that many, if not all of them, were had died in their youth or they were uh, children who were not born. Those, uh, those were who were aborted, for example, and they were in heaven and they were joyous. And I realized something very profound through them and others that I experienced in heaven, and that was, that they had emanated um, or reflected um, the presence of the Lord to me so that their joy was almost um, vicariously imparted to me. There was a there was a threesome in heaven that I saw holding hands. There was a woman um, with long straight hair. There was a man uh, with kind of a goatee. Uh, There was another man with um, uh, kinky hair. Uh, By the way, there are no, you know, for people who want to know about, uh, you know, colors of, you know, uh, and racial ethnicity, uh, none of that (laughs) meant a single penny in heaven because the, the, everyone reflected uh, the character of the Lord in their lives, and they were consumed with that. So I, we had a mutual love. So I had this uh, love for them that I, I've told even to this day that I try to manifest for others, and I do have a greater love for others from uh, from my experience. But they were uh, holding hands, and they were praying. And I knew they were praying for somebody in this world. I don't know if that was a person who didn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, or or if it was somebody who was going through suffering or whatever. But here's a thing, Ryan, that I think was absolutely incredible. So Jesus never left my side while I was walking with him. And then I looked at the this uh, threesome holding hands and they were praying. I saw Jesus in the midst of them. He was in the middle of their circle. At the same time, he was by my side. So that's again a phenomena that can't be explained. You know, how Jesus could be with me the entire time by my side and also in their midst. And there was a time that he opened up a window 
uh, to this world for me. And I saw people, it was looked like a city uh, where people were just going back and forth, you know, drinking their coffee, uh, going about their day. And I, I don't, everything was intentional in heaven. Nothing was happenstance. So everything had meaning. And so Jesus was imparting uh, that meaning to me as we were walking together. Now, some of it did come verbally. Um, the first words I heard from Jesus were, trust me. Um, but, he, and part of it was that, that knowing, which was the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was with me the entire time. He was also a person who I knew and was communicating with during this time. I perceived, um, God, the father and the glory of the Lord just creating and pouring down. So when I saw that cityscape, so I was seeing the, the glory of God, the father, um, just imparting creation and just just imparting whatever was new uh, coming from the throne. So again, Jesus was was there on the proverbial throne, but it wasn't like a you know, an armchair kind of throne. It was a glorious, glorious uh, thing that all, again, there are no words really to describe. But the Lord was pouring down words, but I realized Jesus was showing me this and he revealed this to me that people were going about their life ignoring God. So here he was imparting things to them and they were going about the busyness of their life and they weren't listening. They were too busy to, to listen to God and he was speaking to them newness imparting things to them. And Jesus was, was, was revealing to me, they're going about and, and how that grieved the Lord. Now grief, and I've been, people have said, well, there's no sadness, no, there's no, you know, any of that in heaven. And that's true. There's no sadness, no sadness. But the grief that I witnessed in the Lord was not um, like we would be grieved by something and saddened. It was a separation. It was a feeling of separation, that they were separated from him. Either they weren't saved or they were ignoring, just not paying attention, not not getting still with him, going about too busy with their lives. Um, and that separation was the part that um, he revealed to me at one point uh, as we were together uh, when he turned to me and he said, do you remember the time in your life uh, when I was a child and I'd fallen on a fence, a strawberry patch that there was a, a wire fence there. And I cut myself, went to the emergency room, had stitches, you know, it was traumatic as a child. I'd forgotten that. But Jesus said, do you remember that when you were a child and this happened? And I said, yes, but um, vividly now, but I, you know, I'd forgotten that uh, in this world. And I said, did you feel my pain to Jesus? Of course, I knew that he felt everything, but he said something that was very profound to me. He said, in this world, I felt others' pain. And I understand that he walked in this world and he felt our pain and he felt that suffering um, in the flesh. He said, but now, meaning in heaven, I feel others' separation from me. Mm. And I was struck to the core with what that meant. He meant that, that he feels the separation and that is the cause of all pain. That is the cause of all suffering. And we know that there are people that go through suffering in this world. And we know that they go through suffering and there are those who, who we know that are victorious through that. They can go through, they can suffer from cancer, they can suffer from whatever it is that is, and, and they just are close because they're drawing in and they're seeking out the Lord and they have this closeness and this peace and this comfort that surpasses their own suffering. And then there are those who go through those trials and they're just mired in the trials and mired in, in the suffering and they're going through this and blaming God and, uh, and just, you know, being the disease that afflicts them or, or the trial that afflicts them. And the two dichotomy of, are those who are draw, who've drawn closer to God, that, that those are the ones who are not separated from him. 
And that was a profound revelation that I had, Ryan, was that God desires to be with us, yearns to be with us, cherishes us, wants our attention, and is constantly speaking into our lives. And many of us, I'll speak for myself, just kind of turn away and or just think, you know, casually, you know, uh, open up the Bible or whatever, and don't realize the that 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 the Lord is intimate with us, and that He is paying attention to us even when we're not paying attention to Him. It really gives, um, I think, further insight to understanding heaven in earth. And when I say earth, I'm talking about us. You know, having heaven in us in that aspect. So that's just a really, really phenomenal uh revelation in that but when exactly did this happen for you the the event happened now almost 15 years ago so i did not share ryan for 14 years and i've written for much of my life you know i wrote for the wall street journal and forbes magazine business articles and and things like that so i was being interviewed on a show and the person knew me and he said uh, there were only a handful of people that really knew my wife obviously and uh this past former pastor and he said i'd like to ask you the question about your nde and i said i really i mean i i've never i've never revealed this publicly and it was on a flight back that i the holy spirit was speaking to me and um, and the Holy Spirit said, I want you to reveal our special time together. And I was like, no, 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 God, please. That's, that's ours. Those are my pearls. I don't want to cast my pearls uh, before others because they won't appreciate them. This was, this was just for me. This was our experience. But I did share it. And, um, and I shared it publicly and, and that's when, when it was revealed. But the thing that really uh, made me understand why God wanted me to share publicly was a, a woman who contacted me. She heard my story and she said that she was contemplating suicide. Mm. And she said she had heard my story and she'd been saving up pills and of pills. She knew exactly how many pills it would take to take her own life. And she said, I've, I've just flushed them down the toilet and I know Jesus, I know him, I know him. And when and she was writing about this and she wrote that she knew him personally and intimately and not just, you know, as a figurative uh, sense of, of who Jesus is. And that, that really launched it for me. So in that, which, now, I mean, you have a brand new book that's come out. And so this is right around year 15 of that. And in and, and, and just a moment, I want, to, I want you to share how people can get that book and where they can find you and all that. But I'm curious, beyond the encounter that you had in heaven, in that 15-year window, had there been any dreams or visions or uh, things in which you uh, had a remembrance or something was was brought back that you didn't recognize that God was highlighting to you. Absolutely. You know, I journaled it uh, after shortly after. So I had all of these recorded, but I have a vividness of recollection uh, about heaven and my experience that, you know, I can't remember things maybe a month ago or two weeks ago even, or sometimes, you know, an hour ago, uh, whereas I can recount every facet in detail. But uh, as you said, in terms of kind of the revelations and the dreams and the visions that I've had, a lot of it centers around the, um, the urgency that God has in these times. Um, there's, there's an urgency to, there's always an urgency for God to, uh, have an intimacy with his beloved. There's also an urgency for those who would be saved to be saved. I mean, those who would be those who are inclined to know the truth. Um, you know, John eight thirty two, um, the, the seek the truth and, uh, those, uh, uh, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. 
Um, so the Lord only knows who those people are that really are earnestly seeking, like I was earnestly seeking as an agnostic. They really, really want to know. And so the visions and dreams that I've had are around that. So um, the visions and dreams that I've had are of the Lord. And I saw this kind of expectancy in heaven that, you know, God in the throne room and expectancy. And there was the dreams and visions are there's a there's a there's a there's a dynamic in heaven between the father and the son. They're one and the son, same God, the father, the son and the Holy Spirit. So they're one. That's the <laughs> triune God. But what I noticed was there is something in heaven between the father that is will be spoken to the son, Jesus, and that would be a declarative statement to Jesus coming forth to reclaim, to claim those who know him. But there is a revival, an outpouring of God's spirit that is predicated in my dreams and visions, predicated on an earnesty and uh, a belief of earnest conviction that his beloved have. In other words, there's, we need to be fully, we need to be like a Joshua generation versus a Moses generation. You know, the Moses generation were those who escaped from Egypt. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. It should have taken them 11 days to get there. But the Bible tells us it was because of their unbelief. And an entire generation had to um, had to die essentially before the Joshua generation, then the generation of believers walked into the promised land. So God is waiting for the Joshua generation. I believe through my dreams and visions that this is the Joshua generation, that this is the Joshua generation, that we have the Joshua generation in our midst today to walk into that promised land. Well, what is the subsequent, you know, outpouring of the Holy Spirit is predicated on walking into that promised land. What is that promised land? That means that everything that is happening today, every everything that is occurring today, government, you name it. I have so many messages, people saying, I feel so downtrodden, you know, I'm, I'm just so bummed out by what's going on today. God is saying, I am the answer. I am the one. Turn your eyes to me. It goes back to that separation. Turn to me. Not the things of this world. The things of this world will not be your answer. I am your answer. That is the declarative word from God Almighty on his throne. I am your answer. When you believe in me and you follow my way, you know, in the Moses generation, they saw the cloud, you know, that was by day and the light the fire by night and still they didn't believe because they didn't look to the glory of God and God is declaring today you look to me I am your Lord I am pouring forth my answer to you look to me I saw it when I was in heaven and people were ignoring him going about their busy life be get serious that was something I love about what you're doing brother because you are talking to people about getting serious with God. This is the day the Lord has made, but this is the day the Lord intends to pour out for all of those who are not saved so that they might realize the miracles and the outpouring. And people say, well, why doesn't God, you know, uh, I don't see dead people being raised and things like that. And I'm like raising my hand. Come on, there are lots of us, you know, there are lots <laughs> of us who have been dead and they were uh, are alive today. Look in the midst for the miracles that are happening. Expect that. Pray for somebody who needs healing and expect that person to be healed because it was the woman who came to Jesus and Jesus said to her, your faith has healed you, your belief in me, you don't doubt. Whereas the others, he got frustrated with them and there was a boy who was in need of healing and he said, you know, how long will I tarry with you? You know, because he was just, he was saying your faith, you know, you've got to believe. 
And that belief is so absolutely important. I'm not saying this is kind of a cursory way. I'm just saying attention on God, the full attention of God drawn 24 seven in a conversational way, the awe and reverence of God that we must be reverent toward God in awe that this is God almighty. And he, he's paying attention to us to know the hairs on our head to that extent, to have that appreciation of who he is in our life and to then know that he's speaking into our life and we need to respond accordingly. So we should be an understanding, I think, you know, um, you know, what, what is it that Lord, the Lord is telling me right now? And, uh, and to me, that's the, the, the greatness of what you're doing and those who are really in serious about this uh, walk in Christ, that, that we need to get serious with him. Two things, and, and, and because it just jumps out, one is uh, very personal to me, but I want to go back. And I'll explain that in just a moment. I want to go back because you said that one of the first things that Jesus ever said to you was trust me, which is very interesting because you just quoted a passage of scripture <clears throat> where a father comes to Jesus and says, my son is dying. The demons try to put him in the fire to kill him or, or put him in the water to drown him. And Jesus responds in a very American loving pastoral way. Oh, you perverse generation. How much longer shall I be with you? It wasn't an insult. It was Jesus basically saying to the guy, if you knew what you were capable of, you wouldn't need me to come with, you know, physically with you. And ultimately the father says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And I, I find this interesting that you quoted that because that word unbelief right there in the Greek actually is not simply without faith or a lack of believing. It's a Greek word that means without trust. So the, what the father really said is, I believe you can heal my son. I just don't trust you to do it. Now, mm -hmm. I'm bringing that out because one of the first things that Jesus speaks to you in heaven is trust me. And that's very, very profound because I think a lot of people genuinely want to believe, but it's that trusting aspect of it. So, I, I you know, I just wanted just for those that are listening, mm. trust is a very, very, very important thing. And mm. it's one of the first things that that was Jesus spoke to Randy, trust me. Um, the other side, I do have to ask this question. This is a personal question, Randy, because I've got you on here and we didn't get to have this conversation in person. So I, I, I want to take advantage of this. Uh, when you talk about being with Jesus and, and, and understanding love and having this aspect of love and, and, and really, really having this really portrayed to you in the manner that it was. I go back to um, when it, it, I had a little bit of a rocky way to come to Christ. I come to Christ. I was already married. I put my wife through hell the first year. Uh, but when I come to Christ, I give up the liquor and the pills and all that and everything. And my wife gets a new husband. However, it wouldn't be to year three of my marriage that I know the day that I fell in love with my wife. And what I mean by this is I remember specifically waking up that morning, looking in the mirror, and I did not hate what I saw for the first time in many, many years. I didn't, even though I'm born again, I'm a pastor at that time, Randy, but I'm looking in the mirror and I don't hate what I see. And I can remember that moment asking God, what is going on? What is happening? I don't understand what I'm feeling. I don't understand what I'm seeing. And I heard the Lord spoke to me or speak to me. And he said, you see yourself how I see you. And I said, how is that? And he said, love. Mm. And all of a sudden, I, I can't articulate in words what I felt. Um, I don't even know if, if there's a way to even describe it. But I just remember that moment. And then I looked in the mirror and I could from an angle, I could see my wife asleep on the bed. And I went. Oh my gosh, I love this woman. Love. Uh, uh. So uh, <clears throat> third year in my marriage is when I say I fell in love with my wife, and that sounds horrible. Um, and it, it's really not. It's a beautiful thing, but it, it, for all intents and purposes, it was wrong on my end. But now... As we're recording this in on November, we'll be married 25 years. And 
I, I realized that my revelation of how to love completely changed. So I, I wanted to ask you, when you come out of this, when you come back to the earth and you're there, do you get that recognition of or that realization that the way that you love your spouse, your children, the people that you're around has completely changed because you got a revelation of love? Yes, that was uh, so, so telling, Ryan, for a lot of us. I think I've gone through that uh, as well. Um, they're having having witness love uh the god of love uh there is both a conviction and a reassurance the conviction part is an understanding so this is love and trust me so they're two different things so my first revelation being with jesus was so this is love and his first words to me, where trust me. So here I am, uh, knowing love. And he's telling me that to practice that love uh, fully, that I would have to trust him. So uh, I, I trust him as as the doubting Thomas previously, you know, and as the Saul before Paul, because I actually, you know, I worked against Christians. I got them off organizations, you know, as an agnostic. I have to say, I hated Christians, you know, before I became one. And so the two things in tandem, the, the knowing love was my revelation, my personal revelation. And the trust me was God's admonition to me that eve that i knew him in the person of love and therefore that was the power that would allow me to love those who were persecuting me even because even today since i shared my story ryan um my wife goes through these uh uh, some of the comments and, you know, 90, 95 percent or so, 98 percent are, are very kind and, you know, thank you and that sort of thing. And I'm, I'm moved by those who are uh, are moved and experiencing the Lord personally. And there are those who are, you know, you're a fake, you're a liar, or I hate you or something of that nature. And so returning love you know, turning the other cheek, you know, which is a conundrum, you know, that people say that that was the biggest social transformation, you know, that uh, Jesus brought because at that time it, before he came uh, to this world, it was an eye for an eye. And he's saying, turn the other cheek, you know, uh, love those who uh, who hate you, uh, return good for evil and that sort of thing. And I think that doesn't come naturally. That does not come naturally. You know, I think you and I probably would share that, you know, um, we have a love for, you know, um, contact sports, football and all that stuff. So it doesn't come naturally, um, but it comes supernaturally. So that supernatural power um, and how does that power come through the Holy Spirit? So I have learned even having experienced the Lord in heaven and having this transformation um, where I do not tr distrust him. Um, I mean, I do not doubt him. I have my periods, uh, obviously, when I'm downtrodden. Um, but also to realize my responsibility, my responsibility. So I see, you know, my wife through the lenses of love, but then, you know, if there's an argument that we have, you know, I have to remember, okay, now's the time <laughs> that I have to get away, you know, don't engage and, and draw closer to the Lord. You know, those kinds of things when when my my um, son or daughter, maybe, or, you know, might challenge me uh, in something, then is the opportunity not to look to them necessarily, but to look to God. And so that's the uh, the epiphany, I guess, if you will, that that I realize. But in terms of the trust issue, you know, what the Lord spoke to me. Oh, wow. I mean, it's like 180 degrees. It's 180 degrees. So 
my prayer life has changed even when I pray for people. Um, but that's the easy part. I think the challenging part is returning good for evil that uh, that compels me to draw closer to God. Because again, I I don't think there's it doesn't come natural. So those are the parts where the, the true test, you know, and and that's the part of drawing closer. And that that kind of uh, Ryan and I'll I'll just kind of close with this. That's the part. That's the part that was kind of the the epiphany for me. One of the epiphanies for me. How the Lord was speaking to me. He said, "Okay, in and of yourself, you can't do this. In and of myself, with you, imparting my presence to you, you can do this. If you want to do it apart from me, it's not going to work out." If you want to draw closer to me and allow me more of me, less of you, you know, I'm strong in your weakness, then you can do these things. And so he's brought me to, you know, this is not natural to me, Ryan, to, to share like this. And this is not, this is not somebody said, you know, um, they introduced me as a minister and I thought minister, really? I mean, that's not, I was, a I was not that. <laughs> But I have a love now for the lost, and um, I have a love for for my brothers and sisters in Christ because I see the I see them more so through the eyes of of love, and uh, and that that's something that uh, that I didn't have before. I well, I love it. So, how tell us the name for those that have been waiting? What's the name of the book? How they can find it, and how they can connect with you? Yes, Revelations from Heaven is the name of my new book, and it came from I wrote a book uh, kind of about turning suffering to joy, and people were writing and they were saying, "I want to hear about heaven, your full experience in heaven." So. I wrote the book Revelations from Heaven. It's being published through, or has been published through uh, Destiny Image, so they can uh, see it online. My website is randyk.org, uh, and um, yeah, it's out now. It released what last week uh, is when it uh, when it came out. So I hope it blesses, and I pray it blesses those who read or read it or uh, or listen to it. And because it came through Destiny, people can find it at Destiny. They can find it on Amazon, Books a Million, Barnes and Noble. Wherever you get your books, you can find your copy. And I would encourage everybody to get a hold of their copy. Connect with Randy. He's on um, all the social media outlets as well. Uh, he has a YouTube channel as well. Uh, he does a podcast with a mutual friend, Sean Tabbitt, as well, as they discuss some of the um, near-death experiences with others and stuff. So... Uh, I want to encourage everybody to be a part of that. Randy, I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be a part of this episode. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, bless you. And thanks for blessing so many others, including me, uh, with what you're doing. And who Absolutely. You are. I look forward to the next dinner. Uh, so it'll be really, <laughs> me really <too>. good. <laughs> Anytime we can get around a table with good food, I'm in. Uh, <laughs> <All right. so. laughs> I'm and, there. And obviously you're a man of faith because you trusted my driving. So uh, I got to drive <laughs> Randy around for a little while. So either he's a man of faith or a praying man one, one of the two. Uh, I, I think I was, I was uh, both praying <laughs> and a man of faith. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, for everybody else, I genuinely hope and pray that this episode has blessed you. It has encouraged you. It has challenged you to further advance the kingdom of God. Until the next episode, guys, we love you and we bless you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for listening to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. It is our prayer that this episode challenged you, encouraged you, and equipped you for the advancement of the kingdom of God. For more episodes or ways that you can partner with Ryan Johnson Ministries, please go to www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Please join us again soon for another episode of the Blacksmith Chronicles.